Right, let's get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm really delighted that Lord Riesel um, has joined me today to talk about the very latest report that's come from the Horticulture Select Committee, um, reporting back on the inquiry that you've been leading, Lord Reedsdale, over the last few months. Um, so thanks for joining. This is hot off the press, just published this week. And that's what we like to do in these quick bites. Webinars is just give people an, uh, you know, a kind of quick snap analysis of what's come out, um, what the issues are that are being discussed so that um, people who are a bit time pressed don't necessarily have to read the full <laughs> 170 odd pages, I think, something like that, was it that? Yes, yes, yeah. I've read them multiple times, but it is quite a tome. Yeah, well, congratulations on report on, on pulling it together. And it was a great read, actually. I spent a few hours this morning going through it and really found it super interesting. So congratulations. Um, but let's start with um, why you set it up. I know that you have to kind of pitch for select committee ideas in the Lords, don't you? Um, and you're, it's a competitive process. Why did you decide to champion this and get into uh, setting up the inquiry in the first place? Um, I didn't. So that's the oh, right. thing. So, um, the champion of the report was actually Janet Fuchs, uh, Baroness Fuchs, who okay. uh, is, is a, you know, she's won silver medals and all sorts of things. So, I mean, she's she's been pushing this for a long time. And apparently this was the third time she'd pushed for a special select committee on horticulture. Um, and uh, she was finally successful. But of course, if you uh, if if you're the one pushing the report, you can't be the chair of the report. Right. Um, and I, I shouldn't tell this because it's, it's speaking out of turn, but um, uh, each of the select committees uh, chairs has to come from different political parties. So it was the Liberal Democrats' turn, and um, uh, I was novel because I know something about farming. Right, OK. OK, so you're a farmer yourself, or have been in the past? No, or? I've got a couple of tenant farms, but I used to do uh, agriculture for the party for a number of years. Right, OK. Thanks. That's really um helpful bit of context for everybody. Um, so let's get started and to talk about the, the piece of work itself. Um, I mean, I certainly felt it sort of painted a picture really of a a sector that's, you know, highly productive, but extremely precarious, really, at the moment. Um, it was quite, I mean, from multiple perspectives, the sort of challenges which the sector faced faces at the moment. Um was there any real surprises as you got into hearing the evidence from different people about the sort of state of the sector at a kind of macro level? Um, so I think it, it can be taken two ways, really. There is a, um, there's, there's an element that is actually upbeat. So uh, there are real opportunities for the sector and in certain areas we are world leading, although you go to other countries and they claim exactly the same thing. <laughs> Um, so there is opportunities in the sector, especially amounts of water, um, you know, certain things like Thanet Earth proves that we can do greenhouses um, or the vertical farm, you know, indoor farming um, uh, grow up, which we went to see, which is producing, will be producing a percentage of the fresh lettuce without any pesticides, um, you know, is is pretty impressive. Uh, but on the other side, we had issues about the problem that if you're producing in the sector, um, you got caught in this ridiculous price war um, between the supermarkets. And somebody actually said, you know, why do the other supermarkets always say, you know, against Aldi, it's sort of free advertising. Um, so they're caught in this sort of price war. And in a cost of living crisis, it's very difficult to say you should pay more for food. Mm -hmm. um, but... The problem is the growers are having real difficulty even saying whether they should put crops into the ground. So yeah. if, if you run into that problem, um, you're going to have security of supply issues. And the problem with uh, in the horticultural sector is if you're then importing from overseas, uh, from water-stressed areas, and somebody said a lettuce is just a very long piece of water, um, <laughs> 
<laughs> you really are turning around and saying, uh, we're putting, we're almost exporting some of our problems. Mm. The season, and it, you know, people don't take it seriously because, but you just look at the egg sector. You know, we're getting eggs from Poland and Italy because people in the egg sector couldn't make a margin, so they couldn't actually produce eggs at a loss. So we're importing them from overseas. Um, we we uh, contacted all the supermarkets and said, "Yes, yeah, so should... you only had Tesco, right? That came was prepared to come and talk to you." It was incredible. So, you know, you've got a select committee. We can't force anybody to come along. Yeah. But, you know, we didn't even get replies from Aldi and Lidl um, and and Sainsbury's. Um, you know, uh, so Quite we did surprising. get more yeah. and a couple of others coming along giving private sessions. I think it's just because they're so terrified of, uh, of being seen to be the bad guys. Um, their point was you know, our margins are incredibly small and we have to provide food at the lowest price. Yeah. Well, we were taking evidence that, um, you know, some of the apple growers, they were making 3p on a bag of six, six apples. You know, how do you how do you go forward on the basis that you're probably going to be making a loss two years out of three? Yeah. Well, I want to come back to that point. Before we get there, though, I'd like to just... Uh discuss a little bit more about this point about reliance on imports and I guess UK self-sufficiency or food security at least and obviously the horticulture sector is, is a little unusual in comparison to other parts of our diet if you like in the sense that we are quite import dependent particularly for fruit yeah um and I was interested in, there was a section where you talk a little bit about um, British produce in the supermarkets and targets around um, the levels of food security that we might aspire to or at least retain here in the UK. Um, I went back to the National Food Strategy response where I think the government basically said, we want to make sure that our levels of self-sufficiency don't decline across the whole of our, all areas of our food, i.e. at about 60% now. Um, I'm, we've also seen, of course, the government buying standards um, consultation or on public procurement, which had an aspiration in it for 50% of publicly procured food to be purchased locally or to a sort of higher env environmental standard. But my understanding is that then that might be have some doubt cast over it now because of WTO. And you also mentioned WTO in your report. I'm curious to understand what's your assessment of the sort of state of play around how far we can go in sort of setting out our aspirations as a nation on I mean, for, for fruit and veg in particular, we probably wouldn't want our dependency on imports to grow even further for fruit, for example, when we're already dependent on 85% of our fruit coming from elsewhere. W what's your assessment of that, that, where we are with that that conversation? Um, I think it's, uh, it's a really difficult argument. I mean, the Americans are doing everything they can to destroy WTO. So whether WTO actually survived the future is a, a separate question. Um, I, I mean, we're not forced to buy from overseas. Um, and I think one of the questions we had for the supermarkets was, um, we have empty shelves. Now, the question there was, do we have empty shelves because they're not prepared to pay more for, um, for fruit on the open marketplace? Um, uh, rather, you know, rather than stock more expensive food. We asked that and they said, no, that's not the case. The supermarkets are trying to build um, strong, secure links with the supply chain. And I think that's, you know, for all the, I wouldn't trust some of the supermarkets as far as I could throw them. Um, there are, uh, I do believe that, you know, they do have this issue and they're looking at the longer term um, supply issues. I mean, Fruit and veg is a very could be a very valuable sector. Um, it uses two percent of the land and produces yeah. uses twenty percent of the gate price. Um, so we we but we seem to overlook it, and this comes back to the whole of the report, which is, you know, I know it's an oxymoron 
joined up government. It never happens and everybody always claims it should. But there doesn't seem to be a government pol overarching policy about horticulture. Some of it falls within DEF rather within the home office, other bits within everything else. And we really, we really need, and one of the real promised it, and they just haven't brought it forward. So it, it's trying to link all those different areas. But my one, one of the areas that the committee was looking at is climate change. Mm. You know, is it sustainable relying on areas which we know are underwater stress now? You know, the some of the, I mean, the supermarkets were arguing we didn't have fruit and vegetables on the on the shelves because Morocco had yeah. um, too much rain and Spain had not enough. You know, and that's coming down the line. There is a second question: is we've now got used to supermarkets where you can buy a tangerine at any point in the year or a watermelon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the supply chains, one month they're coming from South America, one month they're coming from Morocco, next Spain, then California. Should we be sort of embedding this lifestyle choice about always having all fruit and vegetables available at all times? Or should we be going back and saying certain fruit and veggies are actually seasonal? Yeah. Now, I know that's not going to be we liked, we liked your comments about sort of uh seasonal veg or fruit and veg campaigns uh, our our partners veg power had fed in to the report on on those points so um it was good, good to see them reflected um let's move on now just briefly to labor the labor section was what i found actually the most interesting probably to some extent because i haven't delved into it in a lot of detail in the past um and i was struck by a few things one was I, you, I, you sort of uh, there was a narrative in there which was the government's sort of solution to the labour problem has been investing in skills and investing in mechanisation, and then you've got the seasonal workers uh, visa scheme, which is there almost as a kind of transition. Uh, well, I got the sense it was a sort of transition because they're trying to reduce the number of visas offered each year. Um, and then there was, of course, some of the quite a detailed exploration of some of the problems with the seasonal workers scheme and two big challenges which seemed to be very striking. One was um, a concern about re exploitative recruitment agencies who were charging for recruitment, which is, of course, against the law and which was essentially trapping, potentially trapping workers into a form of modern slavery. Um, and the second problem with some perhaps um, more rogue farmers, not rogue, maybe that's the wrong word, but you know, not there was no by no means a suggestion that this was across the board, but a few farmers who were just not taking care of their workers um, properly and with people living in really terrible conditions. Um, and so, yeah, I was sort of, I guess I was kind of left thinking, gosh, we've got this sort of quite, you know, challenging scheme and a, a, a and the farmers seem to be saying, but the robotization and the mechanization and the skills agenda is just not moving fast enough. I was fascinated, by the way, by the pollinator drones and the yeah. robotic wheelbarrows. Um, <laughs> But I mean, do, do you think is that is that is that the government's logic that somehow these two things are going to sort of replace the need for uh, it, migrant labour? So I, I think the funny thing is you break it down into a number of different areas. I mean, there's a lot of questions in there. Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. And there's a lot of politics in there. Um, so I think starting off on on the need for migrant labour. Um, or seasonal neighbour. I mean, it's not migrant. This is the trouble. They've mixed yeah. it up between migrant and seasonal. So um, we've needed um, seasonal workers from the 1920s because the problem with, you know, farm produce is farms aren't in the middle of cities. Often they're not even on the end of a bus route. Um, it's hard physical labour and it's not unskilled. This is, you know, everybody says it's unskilled. It's not really if you're producing the amount. So farmers have relied on 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 seasonal workers who can pick a vast amount very quickly. Um, 
for, since the 1920s. And we've had seasonal worker schemes since then. The difference between seasonal workers and migrants and asylum, which seems to have been lumped together by our wonderful Home Secretary, is that um, the migrant workers, uh, so, so seasonal workers, go home. In fact, the bodies who have been vilified are those bodies who actually, I think there's four organisations who, uh, who bring in seasonal workers, are very highly regulated. And if, 97, if any less than 97% of the workers don't go home on time, they lose their license. Mm. Um, so, and, and farmers want seasonal workers to come back year after year and go home again. So they, most farmers try and build really good accommodation to bring them back because it's better. They, you know, a lot of them get their sort of, um, their foreman from the seasonal workers who come year after year. So there is that problem. The problem that recently has happened is the government suddenly said, oh, well, we're going to breaks and not allow any seasonal workers because that's migrant, which is not the same. Um, by slamming on the brakes, of course, uh, last year, farmers lost £60 million worth of produce could, yeah. that couldn't be picked. And a lot of that was because of, you know, it became this political football where they turned around and said, oh, well, we'll work out how many seasonal workers you, leave, uh, you need and you have to apply in January and we'll set the amount. And they sent it at the 20th of December. You know, yes. five, so you had no idea how many workers you could get the whole season thing was up in the air and some of the bad practices because farmers find it difficult to get the accommodation on time you know if you don't know who, who's coming now there are rogue farms rogue elements and i and one of the point put to us by some of the good farmers was um that it's not in their interest to get seasonal workers back next year or not to be able to get seasonal workers at all so i think whilst we did we got some amazing, um, uh, amazingly good uh, um, evidence sessions from um, from three people, one from South Africa, and she was amazingly um, erudite. <laughs> In <laughs> fact, you know, the evidence she gave was on the BBC website for like three weeks, <laughs> the news website. Um, and, and she was giving it occasions where, you know, uh, men and women were being forced to share caravan space. Yeah, I read that. I yeah. mean, that's, but that's totally And how freezing it was as well. Just, it is freezing. Yeah. Um, you know, it was cold. Uh, although one of the guys who was complaining said he was coming back. Because <laughs> so, right. um, uh, I think people do see, you know, with good farms, it's good conditions. But then you come down to the fact that it is very hard work. And this whole thing about automation, uh, one of them goes, good luck getting a, a robot that can pick a, 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 a raspberry. You it's know, so certain, delicate. Yeah. So it's squash, yeah. yeah. Um, we went to the Netherlands and saw how they were actually spallionating their pear trees so that robots could pick them. Interesting. So, so building the, making the pears around the actual robots rather than the robots around the pears. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so automation, is an answer and it is coming down down the line but we are going to need seasonal workers we should have you know we should have a stable seasonal worker scheme that is well regulated and this is the thing that the government's throwing the spanner in the works especially over covid um which is hitting farmers and if they can't get seasonal workers and then they suddenly do get a quota it hits the ability to house them i mean mm -hmm. one of the other things was planning how do you get planning for for mm. accommodation for seasonal workers, you know, unless there's some we've got a housing crisis, yeah. So it, it, it's a really difficult integrated problem. But one of the issues that everybody was complaining about and said is a problem is that the the worst exploitation of seasonal workers is in the countries we're calling pulling them from in the first place. So it's those people who charge enormous fees to get to here. A, it's actually a set fee for the visa. And you're not allowed to charge anymore. But of course, a lot of seasonal workers don't know that. So they turn up with debts that they have to pay back. It's illegal yeah. to do it in the country, but not in the countries they're coming from. And just one final point, sorry, I'm going to go on, because this is a really interesting large area, is, is that um, we used to get seasonal workers from France and Germany. Now it's moving over to, then it moved over to Poland. Now it's moving, a lot of seasonal workers came from Ukraine. Of course, that's, being disrupted. Now we're getting from them from Kazakhstan, 
and a lot are now coming from the Philippines because, you know, it's not a high paying job. So you're going to those countries which people will come over because it's 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 worth more. And that's not just our problem. That's a problem France and Germany are facing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, everybody's pulling in from further and further afield. Um, I was also I was having a look at the evidence which the Land Workers Alliance submitted, which they where they you make a point quite a, a number of points actually throughout the report about the fact that um, uh, so many of the government schemes, particularly um, the um, ELMS sort of elements are not. Um, you're, if you have a farm that's smaller than um, five hectares, you're not eligible for a lot of those schemes and the, what was striking about reading the Land Workers Alliance evidence is that they on labour they say actually there's a lot of people want to get into small scale uh, horticulture um, for a whole raft of, of different reasons and it's it's felt very much reading your report that that sector has been really neglected by the policy instruments that are being developed at the moment to support the sort of transition from cap to elms and that i mean you make it in your recommendations how important it is for the government to pay attention to that group yes definitely i mean there's problems all through from you know education through to you know there's only one college that's providing horticultural um you know further education yeah so, yeah yeah you know, all disappearing and if you if you don't make it attractive to young people how do you actually get them into the sector um so yeah. we had this thing about it shouldn't just be a primary school we should be saying look there are jobs going forward um uh but the, the problem with elms is elms is sort of coming in and it's almost replacing cap um but there hasn't really you know it's an environmental scheme which is great is where cap was going um but a lot of farmers are going to find that the subsidy regime changes badly after Brexit, you know, as, as it's starting to come in. And a lot of these subsidies can disappear. Mm. And turning around to DEFRA and saying you've got to be more nimble. Uh, the five hectare rule has actually changed. But, um, oh. yeah, so it, it, you will be able to go under five hectares, um, I believe. Well, that was the evidence we were given. Um, okay. But it is a question of how how you know how the government is developing these schemes because of course yeah. now they can develop the um the schemes outside of the european framework um you know farmers are going to have to fight their case for subsidy uh, along with everybody else and is mm. that the is that going to be guaranteed i'm not sure mm. Okay, we've got a couple more minutes and I just wanted to move on to the more of the sort of consumption side. So you've touched on the the sort of problem with essentially the supermarket sort of being really the principal route for people access, getting their fruit and veg, them creating, you know, these quite unfair supply chains, which are where pressures and risk are all pushed down to farmers. And you make some strong recommendations about the grocery code adjudicator and the extent to which those powers could be strengthened um and then you talk about sort of nutritional security as a public good i'm interested to know what you mean by that and how how what does that how does that translate into policy thinking i guess um well this was the funny thing about horticulture i mean we we had um 18 uh, days of taking evidence and 24 sessions of an hour and a bit each mm. um, with usually three experts on each session so we took an enormous amount of evidence because it's so wide as an area um, you know from the mental health of of actually being involved in this but one of the areas of course is we just don't eat for a lot of people we don't eat enough fruit and veg you know we're moving towards processed food uh, you know I'm, I'm patient yeah, of yeah. it it's charity in Newcastle went to the local supermarkets there is no fresh food and bread you know yeah. it's all processed food heavy sugar so we really need to do that and and you know it has a has an effect on our well-being so it's well in the cost of living crisis all of our data is pointing to the fact it's the area of the diet where people are just cutting back because of affordability problems basically it, it, it is and you know and it should be seen as central 
Yeah. You know, and you, you, I was finding that, you know, you look at middle class kids in schools and they're usually a lot, um, a lot slimmer than, you know, the working class areas that I've worked in because, you know, you've got this food desert where not only isn't there much fruit and vegetable available, but people aren't even taught how to, um, how to actually cook it, how to mm. eat it. And I think that's, you know, we need to, we used to have home economics. We almost need to get back and teach people, you know, how to do this and not rely on the fact they're suddenly going to uh, know how to actually prepare vegetables. Mm. Well, you made some good recommendations about, well, I think you reiterated the recommendation about the school fruit and veg scheme being, um, I mean, improving the quality of that scheme by being able to procure from a wider range of suppliers, respecify the scheme, which, um, I mean, we'd also like to see that scheme expanded because I think the, the com you know, it creates a moment in the school day where kids are all eating something like that together uh, alongside the school meal, of course, and getting as much fruit and veg into the school meal. Yeah, um, I mean, that's be tough because I was talking to some schools about, you know, how much they actually have to spend per child. And when you've got to produce a, a yeah. meal for £1.50, you're going... You know, it's it's going to but, be. Tough. I mean, I think the point you're the point that you're talking about, thinking about nutritional security as a public good, is a sort of it's a it's a fundamental gear shift at the sort of macro policy level to think right. We've got a diet crisis that's heavily impacting the NHS. Also, what we eat is in, is contributing to our climate, the and biodiversity mm -hmm. impacts. Like, um, if we were to think about this as nourishing our nation, what would we, what's the mix of interventions that we need to enable people to eat in a way which protects their long term health? I mean, it's a big gear shift in terms of thinking at the moment. We are so far from that in the conversation. <laughs> are, you, are you optimistic that some of these recommendations, we, we only got like a few seconds? Are you, do you yeah. sense that there's interest in taking this agenda forward? Yes and no. I mean, government is a big machinery. It's difficult. But I think there's a lot of knowledge out there and there's mm. a lot of people trying to do some very good things. You know, from you know, we were talking about the NHS, you know, prescribing gardening for the people's mental health. Mm. You know, it's it, it and, and the fact that, you know, people are getting engaging more with, you know, since lockdown, we've all become gardeners, you know, and pot plants. I kill loads. <laughs> but, but you know it's uh i think it is trying to get into people's minds that if we don't take this seriously the public um the nhs and the public health issue is going to be is not going away mm. on that note thank you lords reedsdale it's been a real pleasure to chat um thank you for taking the time at short notice and thanks everyone for joining um, we'll circulate the recording so you can share with others um, who might be interested to listen in. And don't forget to also subscribe to the podcast. Great to meet you. And thanks, everyone. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you.